Welcome everyone. Today we're tackling an injury that, well, it causes more than its fair share of clinical headaches, the scaphoid fracture. Seems simple, maybe, but it's full of tricky spots. Why focus on this specific bone today? Well, scaphoid fractures are just really common, especially in younger active people. We see them all the time. Right. And they often happen from something pretty routine, like falling onto an outstretched hand. Ah, the classic Bofi. But why are they so difficult? Why do they consistently seem to catch clinicians out when it comes to diagnosis and uh, proper management? It really comes down to two things. First, how they present can be super subtle really easy to miss. Okay. But the bigger issue, the really significant risk, is the potential for serious long-term problems with the wrist if they aren't picked up and treated promptly. So our goal here is to maybe highlight some key things for spotting them early and managing them effectively. Okay, let's paint the picture. Patient comes in, classic fall mechanism, what signs, what symptoms immediately make you think scaphoid even before you see an image? Yeah, usually it starts exactly like you said, that fall onto the outstretched hand. Often the wrist is extended and sort of deviated radially. Mm -hmm. That specific position channels the force right onto the scaphoid. It's almost a textbook setup. And what does the patient usually complain of? Typically pain. Pain right on the thumb side of the wrist, the radial side. They often say it's a deep kind of achy pain. Does it get worse with anything specific? Yes, usually movement makes it worse or gripping things. That really brings it on. Okay, and on examination, the famous test. Right. Tenderness in the anatomic snuff box, that little hollow on the side of the wrist. That's the classic one. And finding that, even if it's subtle, should ring alarm bells. Absolutely. Even mild tenderness there, especially with that fall mechanism, should make you suspicious. Are there other signs to look for? Sure. You might see some swelling, maybe a decreased range of motion pain if you push along the line of the thumb, that axial loading. But honestly, these can be really subtle. Hmm. You might not notice them if you aren't specifically looking. So it sounds like the key isn't just knowing the signs, but really maintaining a high level of suspicion, almost like you have to actively look for reasons to suspect it. That's exactly it. A high index of suspicion is crucial, especially, and this is important, if the first set of x-rays look normal. Right, the occult fracture. Let's talk about that. You mentioned initial imaging might be clear. What does occult mean in this context, and how often are we talking? Occult just means hidden, basically, not visible on those initial x-rays. Even with special scaphoid views, the fracture line might just not show up right away. And how common is that? Studies suggest it could be up to 20%. One in five scaphoid fractures might be invisible initially. Wow, one in five, that's... That's a lot. So clinical picture screen scaphoid, but the x-ray is negative. What's the absolute next step? What should clinicians do? You have to treat it as a scaphoid fracture until proven otherwise, period. So immobilize them anyway. Yes, immobilize them, usually in a thumb spike, a splint, or cast. Don't just send them home hoping it gets better or wait two weeks for another x-ray without treatment. That delay can be really detrimental. Okay, so suspicion is high. Initial x-rays are negative. We've immobilized. How do we actually confirm the diagnosis then? What about advanced imaging? Right, this is where things like magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, come in. MRI is excellent, very sensitive, and specific for picking up these occult fractures. And it shows more than just the bone. Yes, it's also great for looking at associated injuries, like ligament tears, and importantly, it can show early signs of potential blood supply problems, like avascular necrosis. What about CT? computed tomography. CT is also very useful. It gives really detailed pictures of the bone itself. So it's great for seeing exactly how displaced a fracture fragment might be, or if it's broken into multiple pieces, what we call combination. And that detail is vital for planning surgery if needed. So when should we jump to MRI or CT? Straight away if the x-ray is negative, but we're suspicious. Pretty much, yes. Early advanced imaging is definitely recommended if that clinical suspicion is high, despite negative x-rays. Waiting just increases the risk of complications down the line. Every day really does matter with these. Complications. Let's get into that. The scaphoid seems uniquely prone to nasty problems like a vascular necrosis and nonunion. Why? What's unique about this little bone? It's all about the blood supply. It's quite unique and, frankly, a bit precarious. Oh, so? Most of the blood vessels supplying the scaphoid enter at its far end, the distal end, and then the blood has to flow backwards retrograde to supply the rest of the bone, especially the proximal part. Ah, oh, okay, so if you break it in the middle. Exactly. If yeah. you get a fracture through the waist, which is the most common spot, or especially through the proximal pole, 
closer to the forearm. Mm -hmm. You can easily disrupt those vessels. And that cuts off the blood supply to that proximal piece of bone. Leading to? Leading to a vascular necrosis or AVN. Essentially, that part of the bone dies because it's starved of blood. And that can lead to collapse of the bone and arthritis later on. And the other big one is non-union. Right, non-union. That's when the fracture simply fails to heal fails to knit back together. This risk is definitely higher if the diagnosis was delayed, if it wasn't immobilized properly, or if the fracture pieces were significantly displaced. It sounds like a situation where a seemingly minor injury can turn into a major long-term problem quite easily. It absolutely can. I mean, you hear about cases, perhaps an athlete who thinks they just sprained their wrist, initial x-rays look fine, maybe they don't get followed up properly. Right. And then months later, they're back with persistent worsening pain, and then you see the established non-union or even early AVN. It just reinforces why you need that high suspicion early on. Trust your exam findings. So what are the real-world long-term consequences for a patient if they develop AVN or non-union? What does that look like for them? Well, it often means chronic pain, significant stiffness, and a real loss of function in the wrist. Difficulty with gripping, lifting, twisting motions. And ultimately, it often leads to degenerative arthritis, what we call SNAC wrist scaphoid non-union advanced collapse. That sounds pretty debilitating. It can be. It can really impact someone's work, their hobbies, just their overall quality of life, which again highlights why catching it early and managing it correctly is so important. Okay, so let's say we have diagnosed it. How do we treat it? What determines the approach conservative versus surgical? It really depends on a few key things. Where is the fracture located? Mm -hmm. Is it displaced, meaning are the pieces out of alignment? And also patient factors matter, like their age, activity level, job demands. So what usually gets treated conservatively? Generally, non-displaced or maybe just minimally displaced fractures, particularly if they're in the distal pole, the end further down towards the fingers or sometimes the waist, can often be managed without surgery. And what does conservative management involve? Primarily immobilization. A thumb spica cast is the standard. It needs to include the thumb to properly stabilize the scaphoid. And how long are we talking for casting? It varies, but it's usually lengthy, typically somewhere between 6 to 12 weeks sometimes even longer. That's a long time in a cast. It is. And during that time, you need regular follow-up with repeat imaging, usually x-rays, to track the healing progress. Hmm. You can't just rely on whether the patient's pain is gone. The bone needs to show signs of healing on the images. Okay. So when does surgery enter the picture? Surgery is usually recommended for fractures that are displaced or if they're considered unstable. Also, fractures of the proximal pole often do better with surgery because of that precarious blood supply we talked about. Makes sense. And what does the surgery typically involve? The standard approach is what's called open reduction and internal fixation, ORF. Basically, the surgeon aligns the bone fragments and fixes them internally, usually with a special headless compression screw. What are the advantages of doing surgery? Well, it provides stable fixation right away. This can often allow for earlier wrist mobilization compared to casting, which is a big plus for patients. It might also lead to faster healing in some cases. And of course, surgery is often necessary if a non-union is already developed or if there's evidence of AVN. Whether it's casted or fixed surgically, what's the overall outlook? And what's involved in getting function back afterwards? Rehabilitation sounds key. Yeah. Healing is slow. That's just the nature of the scaphoid. It often takes several months, maybe six months or more sometimes, for solid union. Again, because of that limited blood supply and the mechanical stresses across the wrist. So patience is required. Definitely. And while the wrist is immobilized, either in a cast or maybe even post-surgery for a period, it's important to keep the fingers and the elbow moving to prevent stiffness elsewhere. Good point. But wrist motion itself has to wait until there's solid proof, both clinically and on imaging, that the fracture is healed. And then once the cast comes off or fixation is stable. Then comes the rehab. A structured program is really essential. Working with a therapist to gradually get back range of motion, then build up strength, and also work on proprioception, that sense of joint position. And returning to sports or heavy activities? That should only happen once there's clear evidence, both from the exam and the imaging, that the fracture is fully united. Trying to go back too soon risks re-injury or disrupting the healing. So wrapping this up, what's the single most important message for healthcare providers listening today regarding scaphoid fractures? I'd say maintain that high level of clinical vigilance. 
really, trust your exam. Don't hesitate to get advanced imaging like an MRI or CT if you're suspicious, even if those first x-rays look normal. Because early diagnosis is key. Absolutely. Early diagnosis and getting the patient into the right management plan quickly, that's what truly optimizes their chances for a good outcome and minimizes those potentially devastating long-term complications. 